such a joy to get to be here with you, and we are excited about this new church. What a wonderful uh, experience to get to see a new church started, get to have a, a small part in, in helping with the church to get started, and uh, I did have to give up my co-pastor <laughs> for you, but that's the Lord's will, and so certainly the way we want it. Before I give the message this morning, I'd like to tell you about a fellow that uh, maybe some of you might remember or know. His name is Richard Mays. And uh, uh, Richard was a World War II veteran. He was a Marine Corps fighter pilot. He finished the war in Okinawa, Japan. The war was over. And he went ahead to finish his uh, uh, military service, when he got out of the military, he started his own business. And uh, he was the, the beginning of the space program, and he started a company building equipment for the space program, and uh, uh, he made a lot of money. And was, you know, it was a good industry, and he made a lot of, a lot of money at that. Well, he retired, of course, and, and he uh, had a vacation home in uh, Elephant Butte. And uh, he started visiting our church, and he was 92 when he came and started visiting our church. And after a little while, he expressed to me that uh, he wanted to get baptized. Well, he was Presbyterian. He'd been active in a Presbyterian church. But I took him to the office, and we, we went over his salvation. And I pressed him on it. I wanted to make sure, you know. But he was very clear. He understood the way of salvation. He uh, had trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. He knew he was going to go to heaven uh, when he died. And I pushed him at it a little bit, just to be sure. He was very sharp, 92, still very clear, sharp mind, you know. And I uh, always enjoyed the, the conversations we'd have and the things he would talk about. But, uh, and so uh, after I was convinced he was saved, I said, well, Brother Richard, I said, uh, why do you want to get baptized? He knew that baptism was not part of his salvation. But he said, you know, I'm Presbyterian. And I mean, his answer was right on. He said, they sprinkle water on you. And he said, I don't believe that gets it done. I want to do it right. <laughs> and so we scheduled his baptism. He was uh, in a wheelchair. He'd lost most of the use of his legs. And so it took three men to get him in and out of the baptistry. But uh, we baptized him. And, and then he would attend church when he could. And so uh, he called me one time. It was some time later. But he called me and he said, uh, Pastor, uh, I'm going to put the church in my will. And said, it's going to be a tithe. It'll be 10% off the top. I said, well, great, you know. Of course, we had no idea what it would be. I knew he had some money, you know, but we had no idea what it would be. Well, two years ago, he passed away about this time. And Brother Tim had his uh, service up here in Albuquerque. Well, shortly after that, we got the uh, contact from the lawyer and uh, uh, to tell us to watch for a check. We'd be getting a check. And so uh, Brother Tim picked up the check in the mailbox, and he looked at it, and, and he'd called me and uh, said, oh, $9,500. And then he looked back again, and he'd missed a zero. It was $95,000 that Brother Richard had left to the church. Well, immediately we knew that God had given us that for ministry for outreach. We'd been praying about a Spanish ministry, the possibility of starting one, but God was not giving us any, any signals on that. And at the same time, God had laid on Brother Robbie's heart to, that he needed to move back to Edgewood. And with that, he'd laid on Brother Robbie's heart the burden to help get a new church started up here. And uh, so the property came available, and we knew that the Lord had given us that money for ministry. And so the Lord laid on our heart for the church that we should help out in getting the lot. And we did that. So we began to pray for a pastor and it was a little while that we prayed for the pastor, and then it began to be apparent that God was calling Brother Tim to be the pastor to start the, to start the church. Well, immediately when Brother Tim confirmed to me that that was God's will, what God wanted him to do, the Lord laid on my heart that the church, our church, should continue to, su to, to support him at what we were giving him already. I took it to the church, and it was 100%. And so it's from that money that Brother Richard left he doesn't know anything about it. Well, he's in heaven now. But uh, from that money that we were able to help in, in a little bit in getting the lot and able to continue to help Brother Tim with his support. Now, you begin to pick up some of that, and that's good. God will work all of that out. But I like the way the Lord does things. It's exciting to see him work. And, and I'm so happy for this new church getting started up here. 
Well, my message is in, uh, from 3rd John, I mean the text is 3rd John, so if you'd turn there please. First four verses. And I want to ask a question about this matter that he mentions here. And the question is simply this. Are you walking in truth? And that's so very, very important for our individual lives. It's so very, very important for uh, all churches and especially a new church getting started. So let's read the first four verses. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. <laughs> and you know, there's something in us that demands truth. If we know something is not true, uh, we don't believe it or we don't trust anything to it. Truth is of very vital importance to us. When we commit ourselves to something and learn that it's not true, well, the result can be disastrous, especially in the matters of soul and eternity. Now, the truth that John speaks of is sound doctrine. And that's what I want us to focus on, sound doctrine of the Word of God. It's the uncorrupted teaching of God's Word. Now, think about this. The Bible, of course, is incorruptible. Peter says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. However, the Bible is not given to us as a systematic theology book. Therefore, we have to study it and study it carefully to find out what it teaches, to learn its sound doctrine. But how can we be sure that we have the uncorrupted teaching of the Word of God and know that we're walking in truth? Well, here it is. God stands ready to guide us into all truth, to teach us this truth if we'll submit to Him and allow Him to teach us. Jesus said, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall uh, hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. And I thought about this matter of truth. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And think about the freedom that is ours when we know sound doctrine, when we know God's truth. There's the freedom from the bondage of sin. There's the freedom from the bondage of the law. And there's the freedom, and it's so important right now for the things that are going on, there's the freedom from the bondage of fear. And much of what's happening right now in our society and around the world is motivated by fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so we do not have to be afraid. And the devil keeps people in bondage through fear of death. Now, we who are saved do not have to fear death. Folks who are not saved, they need to be afraid of death in, in a very serious way. But we have been delivered from the, the, the bondage of fear. And think about a lot of the things that are, that are happening, that are going on. It's prompted by fear. We don't have to be afraid. Another thing the truth teaches us and this is so comforting as we uh, accept it and, and, and focus on it, God's in control. God is in control. Nothing is happening that's outside of His control. His minute control. He orders things to happen, and He permits things to happen. But all of it is under His control. And so when we think about that, you know, the well, first thing I think about is, I can't comprehend that. And God tells us, no, you can't. It's above you. But, uh, and I don't know how he does all of that. But I can, and God's given us all the ability to believe him and the capacity to trust him in this. And when we do, that dispels our fears then. Now, in this current situation, we don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to fear the virus. I mean, be practical and, and, and take the normal uh, things that you would be, uh, cautions you would take, you know, when there's a possibility of disease coming. But we don't have to be afraid of that. And what that does now, we realize that where we are 
and, and a little bit we can understand about what God is doing, the things that he brings about and the circumstances and so forth, is with the focus of getting people saved. I, think, I say it this way. Uh, God does things with the, the primary uh, objective of, of the optimum potential for souls to be saved. And so, as we look at these things and, and we have opportunity, we can present ourselves to the Lord and say, Lord, okay, where do you want me to plug into this? How do you want to use me, ever what your will is, to be a help and a blessing to people? And as we are, have victory over the fear ourselves, then God can use us and maybe to lead someone else to the Lord, to bring them to Him. So, isn't God's truth wonderful? We're free from the fear. But Paul told Timothy that the time would come when men will not endure sound doctrine. Instead, they will uh, uh, run after teachers that will teach them what they want to hear instead of the truth. Second Timothy said, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth, shall be turned unto fables. And we know this. Many preachers and teachers are deceiving their listeners. Much of what they say is not true. And we're warned of this. Again, 2 Timothy, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Then Peter said, but there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, of whom, uh, by reason of whom the way of truth is evil spoken of. So this brings us then to a focus on the importance of sound doctrine. One of the qualifications of a pastor is given in Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. And so uh, sound doctrine is very, very important. It's vital, as I said to our individual lives, it's vital to a new church. It's vital to uh, a, a, an old church that we stay with sound doctrine. So sound doctrine is the faith once delivered to the saints. Jude tells us this, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the co of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So there's one faith. It's the body of sound doctrine given to us in the Scriptures. Now, sound doctrine is the basis for fellowship and unity in the church. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, if you will, please. We're going to spend some time here uh, on this matter and, uh, in Ephesians. But think about it. It's the basis for fellowship and unity. There are those that would disagree with us on that. But let's look at this and let's uh, stay, stay clear with the Word of God. I want to read the first six verses to begin with, and we'll come back for some more of it in just a moment. Paul said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body, one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, we're talking about the unity and, and our fellowship. Amos said, can two walk together except to be a great? And of course, the answer is no. Now, we're to promote unity in the church. What verse 3 says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What is it that unifies us? Verses 4, 5, and 6. Notice that one here that's mentioned, that unity in it, one. There's one body, one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So these are the things that we agree on. We come to this and it unites us. We agree on the inspiration and inerrancy of the Scriptures. Uh, there's those that, uh, well, I, 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 don't, I won't take time on the, each of these that I'm mentioning, uh, you know, as a, a full message or maybe a series of messages, you know, to expound on them. But the importance of the Scriptures, the Bible is 
verbally inspired. Each word is inspired. All of it is inspired. And God has, I'll just, just say this. I won't take, I don't have time to, to offer the, the proofs and everything of what I'm going to say. But God has preserved his words. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. My words shall not pass away. God has preserved all of his words for us. And he has given it to us in our Bible, the King James Bible. God brought the Old Testament, the preserved words there, the New Testament, the preserved words there. He brought them together and he guided men to translate those into English, our language. And he's given it to us in the King James. So I'll just say this. I recommend to you the King James. It's your choice, of course. But I recommend this. From my experience, 49 years almost now, and this is the only Bible I've ever used. It's the King James. I've looked at others, and I don't trust them. So I can recommend to you, without any reservation, the King James Bible. You're safe. It contains all of God's preserved words, accurately translated into our language. I, I just uh, saw something just recently. I didn't know this. Do you know that English is the widest spoken language in the world? And I was amazed at that. More speak, people speak English, understand and speak English, than any other language in the world. Chinese, the, 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 uh, and, uh, the, the Hindis, you know, and uh, wow. And, and look then at the focus of the English Bible that God has given us. If that's your language, I recommend it. I'll just, I'll move on now. Now from that, the scriptures, and, and to have sound doctrine, we've got to have a sound Bible, because that's where we get our, 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 our uh, doctrine. So we agree on then, from that, we agree on the virgin birth, the deity of Christ. Jesus was born of a virgin. It was necessary for him to be free from sin. Jesus is God, become a man. A child was born, a son was given. And so the, the virgin birth and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We agree on the vicarious death of Christ on the cross. Vicarious means substitutionary. Jesus died as our substitute. And in order to be our substitute, he had to be free from any sin that he had committed. And he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And so completely apart from sin, he was able to die and pay for our sin as our substitute. Then we agree on the literal, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You can be assured that when those Roman soldiers took his body or allowed his body to be taken down from the cross. He was dead. They were executioners. That was their job to execute those that they nailed to the cross. And they didn't let any of them come down that were alive. It was a forfeiture of their life if they did. And so you can be assured Jesus was dead when they laid his body in the tomb. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took the body down and laid it in the tomb. Three days later, Jesus arose from the grave. And what a glorious thing that is for us. We agree that salvation is by grace through faith and not by works. Uh, there's no works that we can do for salvation. We agree that e uh, in the eternal security of those who believe in Christ. Think about that. There's no works that we do to keep ourselves saved. So salvation is entirely uh, by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. And then we agree on the importance of the local church. Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, there's a lot of counterfeit organizations that call themselves churches. One thing about counterfeit, you got to have the real thing before you can have counterfeit. The Lord has true churches scattered around the world. You're one. You're becoming a true church. A true church uh, grows its first uh, distinctive is the Bible. It's its only rule of faith and practice. And you are becoming and, and, and being a true church. And you can be assured that Jesus said, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. You can be assured uh, he hasn't stopped. And the only thing that can stop the church is himself. And he will do that at the rapture. And so that brings us to the last thing that I'll, I'll emphasize here. We agree on the personal and literal return of Christ to the earth. <coughs> now, we're talking about fellowship. We're talking about important truths that we believe. 
And here's where fellowship really enhances as we have fellowship in church and we're looking at these truths. Each one of us can only see the truth from our perspective. And so I'm over here looking at the truth. We agree with it. You're over here looking at it. We agree. It's true. But I'm seeing facets over here. You're seeing facets over here and they're a little different. You know. Now here's how we grow we fellowship and we discuss those things. You tell me what you see, I tell you what I see, and then both of us have a better and broader understanding of the truth. And so that's the importance of truth in the church. Now, I said that there are those that uh, disagree about, about having uh, uh, doctrine. Uh, they don't want doctrine. They reject it. Why? I said it divides people. And it does. Doctrine divides. However, this division is necessary if we're going to obey the Lord and truly be of help to those who do not believe the truth. Now, what does he say? Here's some, some clear instructions. We're to, avoid the, we're to avoid those that teach false doctrine. Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. 1 Timothy 6, If any man teach otherwise, <coughs> and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, from such withdraw thyself. We're to refuse them entry into our houses. 2 John verses, uh, chapter 1, verses uh, 9 and 10, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive them not into your house, neither bid them God's speed. And we have to be wise. Be careful. The Lord says, avoid those that teach false doctrine. Don't entertain that. Oh, I'm strong and I know, I know the truth. And the Lord said, stay away from him. So he knows better than I do. I, may, I ain't as strong as I think I am sometimes. And so he says, avoid them. Withdraw yourself from them. And so don't let false teachers into your house. Well, now there are those, a few, that still go and knock on your door. But there's other ways that they get into our house in it. Through the media. And so we have to be wise and be very careful to not entertain them because the devil is looking for any opportunity to get us sidetracked and get us away from the truth. And then we're to rebuke the disobedient with sound doctrine. Paul said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And again, what I said about the, uh, one of the qualifications for a pastor, that uh, he's to, with sound doctrine, uh, exhort and convince the gainsayers. Now, the other side of this, these beliefs protect us. In Ephesians 4, now look at verse 11. Let's read verse 11 to 16 and we'll comment just briefly on that. He gave some apostles, the Lord of course, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working the, me of the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body to the edifying of itself in love. <coughs> so godly pastors, they teach, they preach, and they perfect the saints or mature them. They do this with the sound doctrine, and, they, and that's what he's talking about, verse 11 and 12, uh, that they were for the perfecting of the saints and for the work of the ministry, the edifying the body of Christ. So this prepares the saints for the work of the ministry. This edifies the body of Christ. This promotes the unity of the faith in the knowledge of Christ. And then this matures the saints after the stature of Christ, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And this protects us from being tossed about by false doctrine. Paul said that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lay in wait or lie in wait to deceive. 
and enables us then to speak the truth in love. And this is so very, very important. Speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working, the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So this, these beliefs, they protect us. And there's others, of course. I just listed just a few. But they help us to grow. We become mature saints. We can work together in the church forming a body that's healthy, that's vibrant, it's growing, and effective in the world around us. We must speak the truth. We must tell people that without Christ they're going to hell. But we should do that with a tear in our eyes, a tear in our voice. We speak the truth in love. You know why people go to hell? Think about it for a moment. It comes down to this. People go to hell because they will not submit to God and let him save them. See, we have free will. All have free will. They have a choice. And those that will submit to God will save them. God's not willing that any should perish. And so we've got to be alert. We've got to be wise and looking out to help people in every opportunity that we have. Now, I'll bring this down. I mentioned salvation here. Sound doctrine is necessary for salvation. I'll bring it. <laughs> I'm going to close here, <laughs> and I promise you. Uh, <coughs> walking in truth begins with salvation. And some of the deadliest false doctrines are those pertaining to how to be saved. There are those that teach there are many ways to be saved. Jesus said, there's only one way. Would you look at Matthew chapter 7? A very startling truth and a very sad truth the Lord gives us here. <clears throat> Verse 13 and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, what is Jesus saying there? Think about it for a moment. What he's saying is this. Of all who claim to be Christian, only a few actually are. That's a startling truth, isn't it? It's a sad thing. There are many that claim to be Christian. Matter of fact, Christianity is the largest religion in the world. There are many that claim to be Christians, but Jesus said only a few have entered the straight and narrow way. And there's only one way of salvation. Jesus is the straight gate. Jesus is the narrow way. Jesus said, I am the door by me. me if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me, unto the Father, but by me. Now, if you would look down at verse... 21. <coughs> and listen carefully now to what the Lord's saying. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father, my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have uh, cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Now look carefully at what the Lord responds. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see what he's saying there? Salvation is not in what we do. It's not in what we know. It's in who we know. Salvation is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Knowing Him. And notice what He said about those that are proclaiming all of the wonderful works that they do. What did He call it? Iniquity. I just recently, uh, uh, that uh, lit up to me, you know, wow. These people that are trying to work for salvation. Lord said, that's iniquity. And what a sad, sad thing it is. So, we're talking about walking. So, what are the steps to salvation. 
Now, they're very simple. They're so simple, a little child can understand them, but they're very precise. The first thing, salvation's of the Lord, it begins with Him. First, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. That's where it starts. How He brings conviction to you will be between you and Him. He knows exactly how to bring that conviction. Maybe you're in church and you're hearing preaching. Maybe you're hearing preaching over <coughs> some other way. Someone knocks on your door, witnesses to you, or, or a friend, or whatever. You may not be in church, but He will bring the conviction to you. And we realize that we've sinned against God and that we're in trouble with Him. And we respond with a desire to be right with God. All right, when we do that, then the Holy Spirit, the second step, if you want to think about it that way, uh, the Holy Spirit gets the gospel to us from the Bible. And ever how He gets it to us, that's according to what you need. With myself, uh, He convicted me. I wasn't in church. He convicted me of my sin. I responded as I, I've written down here. And uh, He got the gospel to me through a gospel track. And I read the gospel. I realized that uh, uh, Jesus had died for me. He paid for my sins. He rose from the dead. And I learned what God required of me was simply that I call on Him and ask Him to save me. And so the third step in, we respond with a simple prayer. For me, the prayer was written in the track, and I didn't know anything. I didn't have any knowledge of, of church and those kind of things. I was 26 years old. I'd been witness to one time in my home. A preacher had come by and shared the gospel with me. I didn't quite understand it. I didn't get saved. But uh, apart from that, I had very little knowledge. I didn't go to church, those kind of things. But I prayed the prayer that was written out on the track. And it worked. <laughs> God heard it. And God saved me. But the prayer can be very simple. Remember the publican outside the temple? Jesus said he would not lift up his head, his chest, but he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said he went down to his house justified. Wow, what a wonderful thing. God responds to that simple prayer by saving us. He forgives all of our sins. He gives us eternal life. And oh, he brings wonderful changes to our lives. Now, this is the only way of salvation. If you're relying on anything else, you're not yet saved. So please, if that's the case, please settle that. I'll close with this simple question. Are you saved?